Hey all viewers, tonight I am going to talk about two concepts, and for this podcast I'm going to refrain from using my dictionary, excuse me, my dictionary programs to discuss these two words. The two words that I would like to discuss are fundamentalism and mysticism. Now, these words can be applied to any religion, um, any particular worldview in general, to an extent. But this word and its application is especially important when we are talking about religious matters. Now generally we can expand that to other ideologies and perhaps even philosophies. But in particular I'm going to talk about the relation that these words and particular concepts have in basically what I suppose I might call a person's individual religion. Um, in my own particular case, I will be talking about Christianity. I have often said that my views are somewhat similar to to Quaker views or even quietist views, but truth be told, I cannot really consider myself a quietist or a Quaker. Um, now, for those of you who do not know, Quakers used to have more of an ordered structure to their worship, um, prayer, and many other particular events that they have engaged in. However, Quakers as a Christian denomination, so to speak, um, have heavily relied upon what we may very well call mystical religion. Now, the way we would define these two words, mysticism and fundamentalism, are very simple. And it is also very important to recognize that these two words are not mutually exclusive. Um, I would consider myself as much mystical as I am fundamentalist, which, truth be told, for many people may seem strange, but as I begin to discuss the definitions of mysticism and fundamentalism, it may become very obvious why I say that and why many people you may know may very well be, um, in a sense, both, you know, mystic as well as, you know, fundamentalist, so to speak. Now, the word fundamentalist, of course, um, the root word of that is fundamental. When we talk about fundamentalist culture, fundamentalist religion, um, what we may call fundamentalist ideology, of course, the word has a very particular connotation in regard to religion, which is what we are specifically talking about. Basically, um, funda in terms of faith, in terms of religion, when we speak of the fundamentals, of course, this has to do with um, fundamental, you know, scripture, to some extent, what we may call a literal or very strict interpretation of, you know, scriptures. In other words, a reliance upon what has been written down, what has been established. Not so much what we would call, in other words, very impersonal things. Things that we can say, well, this has been written down and this is what this means. And basically, 
we may change our opinions and we may have different experiences, but what is fundamental is clear, so to speak. In other words, when we speak of fundamentalism, we're talking about something that, for the most part, people look at and they say, wait, if, if there is something fundamental to this religion, it is that. And so the idea is, the fundamentalist view would be, well, if you lose that thing, you do not have a faith. These are the borders, the sort of con- components which keep this particular Weltanschauung consistent. In other words, this particular worldview that we're talking about, this particular religion needs a basis, and th- that basis is what we call, we can call, the fundamentals. So, this is what we what fundamentalism is all about you know basically those things which cannot really be too affected by personal experience but nonetheless are sort of cleaved to as basically the very framework of the faith so to speak. Um, This is very important in regard to Christianity, and this is the context in which we are going to be talking about this. This is going to be the context of our discussion. Now, if you were not Christian and you are part of this discussion, if you decided to listen to this podcast, please feel free to join because in this particular case, in regard to this, the discussion of fundamentalism, fundamentalism and, and mysticism, um, these two concepts apply to our religions generally. Um, we know, you know, cr- fundamentalist Christians are widely known. There are also fundamentalist Buddhists, and as well as um, fundamentalist Hindus. Um, fundamentalist, um, excuse me, fundamentalist Muslims as well. They're also mystical religionists, um, people who value the mystical, what we may call the mysterious aspects of religious culture. Now, I do use the word mystic a lot. And I'm sure that some individuals, you know, especially Christian listeners of mine, and I do know that I do have some, um, some of my viewers are Christian as well, and they may wonder, well, why am I talking about mysticism? Why am I, wait, mysticism is not Christian. There cannot be mystical Christians. Mystics, mysticism has to do with magic. And no, not necessarily. Um, the word mystic is applied in a very particular sense in religion, which many people are very unfamiliar with. Now, truth be told, there is such a thing, and it is actually possible to be a mystical Christian, while at the same time preserving the fundamentals of the Christian faith, which is what I do. Actually, I would say that many you know, Christian mystics throughout history have been fundamentalist as well. Now, the reason I mention this is because today, in our day and age, sad to say, many liberal Christians like to appropriate the concept of mysticism as well as people who are involved in particular, in particular fraternal as well as sororal brother, you know, brotherhoods and even sisterhoods, um, groups of an occult nature. They like to take a word which Christians did use as well in reference to themselves and was, uh, happened to be a very pivotal part of their vocabulary to describe mysteries. Mysticism is about mysteries. Now, what makes something mysterious in Christianity, um, as well as really any religion that the concept is used um, in reference to, 
is personal experience. When we talk of mysticism in the Christian context, we are talking about that which is personal as opposed to that which is sort of, you know, how should I say, sort of impersonal or just simply not something that we would describe in terms of personal experience. Um, such as written down scripture that is very clear. Um, when we talk about mysticism, we are talking about the personal and very mysterious experiences of an individual. Now, Christians have these experiences, and we call these experiences mystical. This is a very simple con- concept. Um, this can be applied to different religions as a term. Now, truth be told, there are some some nuances to it. Um, contrary to what peradventure you may have heard from you know, other individuals. There are some liberals who like to say, well, you know, Quakers are different than other Christians. Mystical Christianity is a Christianity about experiences. You know, we can divorce ourselves from any fundamentalism. We can accept modern science as basically the, the basis of our Weltanschauung, and we can get rid of, you know, any type of, you know, how should I say, um, old teachings that we used to believe in. This is some, this is an appropriation of a, of a concept that was understood and to some extent is still understood now. There was, un, there was an understanding in the past that Christians, you know, in some cases would have personal experiences during prayer or, you know, even deliverance. You know, exorcism itself is something considered to be mystical. It is a matter of personal experience. In other words, even though it is described in our New Testament Gospels, you know, for example, prayer is described, um, you know, fasting, you know, deliverance from demons. All of these things are described, but when they are put into practice, ultimately what you basically are left with is what we may or may not consider to be a mystical experience. When it happens in our lives, it is what we would consider to be a mystical experience. Not an impersonal experience, but a very personal experience, because in this regard, you know, this is, you know, something that is very mysterious and something that is, that we are actively engaged in, um, to put it frankly. And so, some people emphasize personal experience ab- above what one may call a f- sort of fundamental st- above a study of the fundamentals um, of basically fundamental scriptures and verses. Some people, for example, let us be very honest, some people are mentally disabled or peradventure, you know, they may be just as religious and have just as much fervor as an intelligent person who can read the scriptures, but they have what Jesus would call sort of you know, that innocent, you know, Jesus, there was a verse about him saying that you should be like children, you should be like these children. Children have an innocent childlike faith. There are some people, and we as Christians have to realize it, there are some people who are not as what we may call sharp or as intelligent as other people. They they may not be able to, to basically pull out a verse, you know, in a, in a moment's notice, at a moment's notice. They may not be as knowledgeable or as skillful in regard to philosophical or religious matters. Um, all right, they may not be capable of debating. But some of those individuals who may 
be what we may call unintelligent, they may have more faith than some of their more intelligent counterparts. And we would ask, how is this true? He does not comprehend the, the scriptures as well as, as you know, so-and-so. He's a dumb man. How is it so that the simple-minded, you know, the meek and the humble, can also be, you know, respected in the religion of Christianity and the scriptures can verify you know, basically by what Jesus said and all throughout the scriptures we know that it is not about intelligence, it's about, you know, humility before God that is essentially important in regard to salvation. That is what we would call, you know, something that has to do with personal experience, something that is mysterious. Because though we cannot explain it, you know, so-and-so, the individual in question, you know, he or she has had such experience through prayer and their own personal relationship with God that it is nothing less than a mysterious sort sort of thing. It is mystical in a sense. When we talk about mysticism, we are talking about sort of a direct experience with God. And so that we cannot explain. And regarding fundamental scriptures, regarding, you know, the sort of fundamental beliefs, you know, that we glean from those scriptures, the basis of our faith, we can explain that in words. What we call mystical, we cannot explain in words. We can try... We can, we can try to explain, you know, our mystical experiences in prayer, our mystical experiences in life, our mystical experiences, you know, in our communication with God, but ultimately, we will always fall short because this is a matter of personal experience. It, in other words, it is subjective. If something is written down on a piece of paper and we have all decided to accept it as our fundamental basis, that is something different. Whether we have different interpretations of it or not, we can say if we all sort of share the same religion and we all basically um, study and read the same books, well, obviously the words in those books are fundamental. Um... Now, interpretation may be different, but nonetheless, we all sort of glean and understand the, you know, you know, key fundamental scripture, so to speak. But mysticism is different because it has to do with personal experiences that cannot really be understood, but by experience. In other words, um, this is not something that a person can really share fully. You can describe, you know, your relationship, your connection, your experiences with the Lord, but we as individuals will not fully understand them. So, for example, some verses are more mystical than others. I'm not so good at quoting verses verbatim, at least not yet, um, in terms of number, you know, in terms of numbers and sort of remembering verse numbers. Some people really are. Um, That is something, a particular group that has caused a lot of contention. The Hebrew Israelites um, have, are famous for doing, and they are, they are so good at it that basically they have sort of confounded a great deal of of other Christian individuals because they are just not as fast in terms of just pulling verse verse numbers and things from the Bible out so very quickly. I myself am not so good at that. Other people are. Um, you know, but Paul was famous for saying... Um, you know, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. 
Now this particular verse is a more mystical verse because what it is not something one can understand but by experience. And I mean this. And so obviously like any verse people take different and have different interpretations of it. However, when one actually tries to put it into practice and one says excuse me, I have a conception of what prayer is. And Paul has said to pray without ceasing, therefore I will do it. So let us say that you as an individual decide I am going to pray without ceasing. Now thou wilt find that it is a very difficult thing to do um, and it will exhaust your mind. You will pray without ceasing, but eventually, at some point, you are going to run out of words. Now, we may call this discourse. In other words, that prayer itself has to do with a request. It has to do with what may one may call, you know, it, you know, pleading or in a general sense communication. And so as you um, decide to pray without ceasing, you will realize very quickly that you will run out of discourse. You will run out of things to say Basically, if you're going to pray without ceasing, much of that prayer is going to be done on a mental level. In other words, many of those prayers are going to be mental prayers. However, what you are going to realize is that you are going to run out of words. You are going to run out of words. And so, what Paul said is something that has to be understood and really experienced. When Paul says you pray without ceasing, that has to be experienced. Because you will start to realize that at some point you are going to be silent. You are going to be silent in both, you know, your speech and mind. And basically you are going to wonder, well, what did Paul mean? I, I've been praying all day. I've been trying to pray without ceasing. I cannot do it. So basically that prayer is something continual, something one could even consider to be passive, something that is kept up. It, it has to be kept up through conduct. And furthermore, at some point, when the discourse ends and you have no more words, and you, whether you are doing whatever you are doing daily, day you know, throughout your day, you sit down to pray, you've been praying all day, you've been trying to pray without ceasing, you have no words. What this teaches some of us, and I'm speaking for some of us because some of us have come to the conclusion, in discourse, there are two things one can do. One can speak and one can listen. There cometh a time when what you will be doing is a prayer of silence, a prayer of quiet, in which you've spoken to God and you've said all you could say. But some of you may feel the need to persevere in your prayers. And so, you will sit in silence and you know, allow the Lord to guide you in that prayer. You know, and basically, for some of you, that will be enough. This is a very mystical thing. Um, because at that point, if you really try to really live what 
Paul had said, pray without ceasing. You are going to run out of words and your prayer is going to basically be without words. Um, you will basically be listening and sort of resigning yourself to God in humility and silence. Now, what happens in that prayer closet that Jesus spoke of, it will always be personal for each individual. Now, the Greek Orthodox people had decided to do something very strange and something that was against the gospel. Jesus Christ had said that you are not to do repetitive prayers. So, what Paul is talking about, it cannot be repetitive prayers. So, if you use that as a rule and you decide, well, if I'm going to pray without ceasing, I cannot say the same prayer and just basically repeat it. Um, you may say the Lord's Prayer maybe once a day, maybe twice, all right? However many times you would like, but the Lord can hear because the Lord is personal. And so if the Lord is personal and you have spoken everything that is on your mind to him, but you feel the need to continue praying, your prayer will be without words. Your prayer will be silent. Now, the Greek Orthodox, you know, what we may call what their mystical practices and what the Catholic mystical practices is to chant with, basically, prayer knots or rosaries. Either they're saying, Hail Mary or Kyrie Eleison, over and over and over again. And that has basically no meaning to it. You would have to assume that the Lord is deaf, that the Lord cannot hear, that the Lord does not understand you, and you have to say the prayer, same prayers over and over again. So this, this verse that, that Paul gave about praying without ceasing, it has been a very confusing thing for many people, but this is a mystical verse. You have to apply experience to it. Now, we would imagine some people have said in certain books I've read interpretations of that particular, um, of that particular, that, you know, recommendation that Paul gives. Some people have, you know, said, well, you know, you have to do what is just and you have to obey the Lord. And you have to, you know, in a sense, your whole life has to be lived in a prayerful way. Now, I think that is true, but I think that the sort of um, what may be called the quietistic understanding that at some point you will run out of things to say, you will run out of thoughts, you will think and meditate upon the Lord so thoroughly and so with such great fervor that eventually you will be in a state where you, you still want to pray but you have no more words. But it is upon your heart to continue praying. What you end up doing is sitting in silence, what we may call a mystical silence. And that is something that many of us can not really explain, but some of us who have done these things, um, you know, who have experienced it, and you know, sort of have a, a personal grasp about what Paul was saying, and we really try to live it. Some of us have come to this conclusion that, you know, at some times, you will have what may or may not be called a prayer of quiet. Now, 
this is a very old concept of what we may call a quietus concept. Um, there were particular individuals during the time of, you know, Catholic hegemony, you know, whether they wanted to be anything else or not is besides the point because, you know, the Catholic Church sort of had hegemony throughout all of Europe and therefore you have many, you know, teachers who lived in abbeys or were nuns and, you know, they, they had plenty of time. And so much of what has been written by them about their own sort of personal and what we may call mystical experiences, you know, they are relevant today because many of us find ourselves in the same situations. And I find myself in that particular situation in which I, I understand what is meant by what some people may call the dark night of the soul or the, and also the prayer of quiet. And to be entirely honest, when you are, you know, going through tribulations in your life, I can, I can say this in regard to my own recent experiences. Um, three, three people in my family passed over. You know, they, they have left this world and this happened basically over the course of, you know, a relative, his daughter, another relative have passed over. That happened in a relatively short period of time. I witnessed the death of one. And as I prayed for his healing and I realized that he would not um, he was going to leave he was going to pass over it was very difficult I prayed for his healing without any any reprieve I prayed until I ran out of words and when you are in an experience like that, you, you will have no words. You do not know what to do. The pain is so great that you just sit there in the presence of God. And you leave it in His hands because you know you have no control. It really does not matter what you pray for. And some people will have that experience where they where you have it upon your heart just to sit there. You've prayed so much your mind is tired. But you still pray and you sit in silence. In other words, the prayer you have is a prayer of quiet. And you know that the only solace you have is, you know, is the God you cannot see, but you are directly experiencing him even in silence. And it may be said that you experience him more greatly in that silence than you would if you even had discourse. In other words, your prayer has no words, but you sit there still. You know, you, it is not a prayer of speech, nor is, the, nor is it a prayer of thought. But at the same time, you you still are praying, but you are praying without, excuse me, without words. Now, some people may say, no, that's, you know, that's Buddhism. That's, no, this has nothing to do with Buddhism. This has to do with experience. This has to do with a situation that some of you will not understand. And this is the sort of defining issue of fundamentalism and mysticism. When you're watching a person die and you do not know what to... When you're in an extreme situation where you're being tested, the only thing you can hold on to is that sort of... It's just literally just sitting there in the presence of God. You know? 
And Jesus said that, you know, he dwells in us. Basically, there are such verses. And so, our faith is, in that moment, your faith is all you have. When you're watching a person literally, you know, pass away, all right? Can you imagine how many, how fervently you would pray that that person will will not pass over, but that he will continue his his life upon this earth? You will pray so hard that eventually you'll run out of words. And all you have is that sort of godly silence where I have to speak on the personal level about this where to be quite honest you will have you know you you know full well that something is meant to happen that this person is going to pass over and there's nothing you can do about it all you can do is is put your faith and resign yourself to the Lord and all you have is yourself that silence even in your mind and your faith that is it now that is what may be called internal recollection um, a sort of internal peace where you have to accept that the Lord is in control you can pray as hard as you want that person is still going to leave and there comes a time where at that point there is not even anything that you can really think up you know, you've prayed so hard that you run you know there is nothing that you can really do but just sit there as they pass away all right and even suffer before you. But the doctors have done everything that they could. And you're praying hard for their healing. But they are not going to heal. The Lord has decided that it is their time to pass over. These are the types of experiences that, truth be told, you know you may not realize that they're mystical in nature. That prayer that you have is going to be different, and that prayer is a more mature prayer. That prayer is a prayer of resignation. This is not a prayer in which you are asking God for anything. This is not a prayer in which you are asking the Lord for anything. This is just a simple prayer of you sitting there in the Lord's presence, and you're resigning yourself with the recognition that everything is in his hands. There is nothing that you can do to change anything. No matter what act of, of will that you take, you know, you simply have that will to be with God. As far as what you are thinking at that time, um, you cannot, you know, you are empty of ra um, ratiocination. Um, this isn't a matter of um, what you can think during it. Because, to be entirely honest, during a real process of pain and stress, there is not very much that you can cognize. So prayer prayer at a deeper level at a more profound level has to be something more than just simply you know formulas of prayer you know repeated prayers you know eloquent prayers exquisite prayers you may wonder what Jesus meant when he said that you you should be like a child 
when you are under some very severe trials, you will have what may or may not be considered to be a mystical prayer. So that mysticism is important. The fundamentalism is also important. The fundamentalism is important because, obviously, you need a basis. The basis is, you know, the basis for the Christian religion is simple. You know, there is a God. He is the first cause. You know, he has created all things by his holy word, who is our Savior. You know, Jesus Christ, who has come to die for us. As, an, as a sacrifice to atone for our sins. And so, because the Lord can forgive us, we should forgive others. Y you know, we, could, we can go on and on regarding these fundamentals. And the fundamentals are good, the fundamentals are important. But we can talk and we can meditate upon these things until we are blue in the face. Um, so to speak. But there comes a time when a person is under trial and a person really has to put the fundamentals into practice and have experiences. There is a time when a man lives his life and matures. And because of certain experiences, you, he starts to gain first-hand experience of something. It's one thing to say, pray without ceasing. But you never know what it's like to pray without ceasing until you are under stress. And you find yourself in such a situation in which you're praying at every chance that you can get. You're trying to, you know... basically please God but at the same time you are only you know capable of so much and you have resigned yourself to God because you recognize how weak you are and how little power you have you do it through humility you do it because you recognize your own weaknesses you know you recognize that in this world you have basically no power. And if, you know, if it were not for the guidance of God, you would be lost. I can say these and they can, these things and they can sound like platitudes. They can sound like truisms. But these are matters of experience. This is a very mature conversation. Some of you will experience what I'm saying, and you will start to love a prayer like this that is dry, a dark prayer that is dry. Many of us, when we pray, let us admit it, a prayer, even by its very definition, is a request. The difference between this prayer that I'm talking about and most prayers is that this prayer that I'm talking about this dark, dry prayer, it really is dark and dry. It is not a request. It is just you sitting or you standing or doing whatever. You simply have a will to be with the Lord. You know that the Lord is in you. You know that the Lord is guiding you. And in that prayer, you just basically rest in the presence of the Lord. Some of you know what I'm talking about right now. Some of you do not. Some of you who may be what we may call fundamentalist, you may say, oh, this is heretical. But I can assure you that I am quite the fundamentalist. I base myself in the fundamentals, and regardless if you think that my doctrine is not, you know, your doctrine, and that doctrine is just simply a matter of religious opinion. Different people have different doctrines, different people have different opinions, 
And so those are not the fundamentals. The fundamentals are things that, I mean, they can be, but not in my opinion. In my opinion, the fundamentals are, you know, very simple things that if you do not have them, um, the very the very idea or the very basis of our religion is questionable. I will put it that way. There are certain things that all of us Christians believe in. You know, Jesus, the Son and High, the, the Son of God and the High Priest of us all. Um, that is written in the Scriptures. You know, He is our our God. Is He the God of the Father? Is He the God of His Father? No. Um, he, is He the Speaker of the Word? No, He is the Word. So, people may have different opinions about that, but these are our fundamentals. Our fundamentals are clear, regardless of what opinions we may have regarding the nature of what we may call the Trinity, or, you know, if we have different ideas. But what I'm talking about now has to do with what may or may not be considered mysticism, mystic experiences. And the concept of a prayer of quiet. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe most of you don't. I do not really know, but if you do not know, you may feel differently, you know, after a particularly bad experience experience happens to you in life, in which it feels as though your life is so difficult at a certain point that you know that the Lord is going to have something some way and there is nothing that you can do to change it. No matter how much you want it to change, no matter how much you pray to the Lord, what requests can you have when you are watching a person pass over? A relative that you know Maybe you can imagine it. And it really doth not matter what prayer you have, you know in your heart. The Lord is going to take that person. You are not ready for the Lord to take that person. But the Lord is going to take him. In other words, that person is going to pass over. That person's life on this earth is going to end. Now, the prayer you have at that time is you, you're not, you are not going to be requesting anything. It is going to be a quiet prayer because you already realize what is happening. There is nothing that you can ask for. The thing that you want the most will not be granted. You have to resign yourself, you know, to the Lord and His providence. Um... And in that sense, we would be talking about resignation. Resignation and humility are things that many people talk about, but they're not things that necessarily everyone has. And some of you may realize that. You may realize that humble people are very hard to find. Meek people are very hard to find. People who have resigned themselves to God are very hard to find. You know, these are mystical things. All right, your grasp of the scriptures may be exceedingly well, but there are things that, unless you have experience, you know, that you will gain in life, you just simply will not know very well. Now, what I have described is, you know, are some aspects of what may be called, you know, Christian mysticism. And Christian mysticism is not pagan mysticism. Christian mysticism has to do, you know, with personal experience and prayer. Now, it was discussed by people like Miguel de Molinos, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, um, uh, the Lady of Contao, um, 
many individuals have spoken about similar things. Now, um, there are Protestants as well, so to speak, and you know, there's a whole history of this, and we already know that to some extent the deliverance movement is a, a mystical movement because you know they have very personal methods that they use that they have sort of derived from experience um, and some people may say that the Lord guided them to do certain things in certain ways but um, for for you as as individuals you know you are going to have your own personal you're going to have to have your own personal relationship with God and listen to what the Bible calls the still small voice of God and in order to to do that you're going to have to be silent the noise is going to have to end at some point and you will recognize that you will not be able to pray with what I may say is full fervor unless you're able to live a prayerful and quiet sort of silent life okay now these things you know they will not be understood by everyone but some people will understand and some people will experience you know painful experiences and trials of testing so to speak and they will know what I mean if they do not already know. So, this has nothing to do with what may be called the pagan mysteries, in which we're talking about initiations and, you know, salvation through knowledge. This has nothing to do with knowing, you know, this has to do with knowing on a personal level, with intuition on a personal level, of a person's relationship with God but this isn't some type of situation where you know as as in the pagan saying oh we're mystical and you know everyone else is profane and they do not have the mysteries no this is about a person's relationship with the Lord and their own personal convictions you know and their own direct experience with God. Some of you, you're going to have a grasp of these things. We cannot necessarily call them fundamental because these are not things you can teach. These are not things that you can necessarily teach as fundamentals. Many books have been written by certain Christians about their own experiences, you know, of prayer, of life, of what they feel the Lord has has taught them or led them to do you know some people are frauds but some people are genuine but even genuine people are ignored and why is that it's be it is because you know people cannot really understand one another fully because this is you know sometimes the Lord dispenses mysteries to his worshipers um, and so, these experiences are what we call mystical. So, for myself, you may call me, or, you know, you may consider me to be sort of a mystical fundamentalist. A, a mystical fundamentalist. In other words, I think both are important. And I think eventually a person who, you know, faith itself, um, it sort of becomes you know, more personal as you mature. As you mature, you know, your prayers become more personal. You start asking for so many things. And you, you the Lord, in my opinion, the Lord humbles, you know, certain people at least. So this is a discussion, this is a discussion about you know, maturity, to be honest. Um, anyhow, people, this may be a strange video, but uh, maybe some of you understand it. Be blessed and farewell.